the time so that um, I can be focused on the presentation and the slides. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so it's almost five after the hour. Um, so I think maybe we should uh, get started. Um, so let me begin by just uh, welcoming everyone uh, to tonight's presentation. I am Rachel Stakem. I'm a nurse practitioner and I am the Senior Vice President of Population Health and Care Management at ICS, uh, where I've had the honor of working for over 20 years. I'm happy to be here with all of you to talk about a topic that is near and dear to me, uh, primary care for people with physical disabilities. Uh, but before we begin, I just need to review some logistics with you, all of you. Um, first, I wanted to make sure that everyone know, uh, let everyone know that we're recording this um, and we will make it available to you on our website. Um, so don't worry about writing things down. You can always go back and listen to it again. Um, our website is icsny.org. Um, we're also going to ask that everyone puts themselves on mute because we are recording this. Um, if you have trouble doing that, uh, don't worry. Connie um, is here and supporting us today uh, so we can do that on our end behind the scenes. Also, as we go along, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat box and I am going to keep track of them. Uh, if there's time, I will ask the presenters after they finish speaking. Um, and if we don't get to it, we have some time set aside at the end. Um, it's, questions are really important to us. Uh, we want to be here as a resource to you. Um, so we will try our best to get through as many questions as we can. So please, if you're wondering about something, ask. Um, at the end, we're also going to have a survey which will help us learn about what we can do to improve our work. So please uh, com uh, complete it. Okay, uh, next slide, Connie. Uh, I want to thank our partners for tonight for, for their support with uh, getting this program out there and that's New York City Health and Hospitals. United Spinal, uh, the New York City chapter, and for the New York City Mayor's Office with uh, for people with physical disability, uh, people with disabilities, sorry. Um, we're grateful for your help. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Okay, so let's talk about why we're all here, primary care. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Adam. So at ICS, we have seen for many years the devastating effect of the lack of preventative care for people living with physical disabilities. Um, we've seen uh, people who have to go to the ER because they can't get a, a quick appointment to treat a urinary tract of infection um, or even to get a needed piece of equipment like an air mattress to help their wound heal. Um, and we know that people with physical disabilities really need a partnership with the healthcare system because to, to be able to get simple things like a mattress um, and to have it covered by insurance. Um, so we wanna make sure that people really, really are able to get that. We've also seen that screenings such as mammographies can be skipped or they don't get completed because the physician um, who the person with physical disability relies on is a specialty provider like a physiatrist, a rehab doctor, or a neurologist. Um, and they don't order tests uh, that primary care physicians do. Uh, I can attest to that. I work at a multiple sclerosis center one day a week and we do not do screenings um, that are typically done by primary care provider. And those screenings are to detect problems um, such as cancer before you have any symptoms. Early detection is usually easier to treat and improves chances of survival. Unfortunately, that, that cannot happen if a test isn't ordered and it is, if it is not completed. Um, and a person with mobility issues will often need modifications to that test that many providers are unaware of. So in 2016, under the leadership of Marilyn Saviola, who was a woman with a disability and ICS's Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Women's Health, ICS created a blueprint to begin to change these findings. 
This blueprint is a guide for making practical changes to the healthcare system that will help increase accessibility and the quality of care for people living with physical disabilities. It also led to the work that we are here to discuss today. It is on our website, again, icsny.org, if you want to read, um, if you would like to read the blueprint. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about why primary care is very important um, for all of us, but per particularly for people with physical disabilities to get good quality care. Um, and we have some great presenters who I'm excited to introduce. So we're going to begin uh, by hearing from Jose Hernandez. Jose is a C5 quadriplegic due to a spinal cord injury, which he sustained when he was 15 years old. After his injury, he developed a passion for mentoring others with similar disabilities, including individuals in nursing homes and in rehab centers. In 2011, Jose had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. as part of United Spinal, Spinal's role on Capitol Hill annual event. This trip ignited an interest in advocacy, and he has been back to D.C. frequently, as well as advocating on state and city issues. He is currently the New York City Advocacy Coordinator for United Spinals Association and the President of United Spinals New York City Chapter. In 2019, Jose was appointed by Mayor Bill de Blasio to be a Commissioner of the New York City Civil Engagement Commission to ensure that the city includes individuals with disabilities in all aspects of civil, civic engagement. He is also a member of the ICS Board of Directors. And then we will hear from Dr. Janine Knudsen. Dr. Janine Knudsen is a primary care physician at Bellevue Hospital, which is part of the New York City Health and Hospital System, who we are working closely with. She received her medical training at Harvard Medical School and the NYU Bellevue Residency Program. She's also a medical director at the New York City Public Health Department, where she works on COVID vaccine and health equity projects. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, <laughs> we're gonna be hearing from Claire. Uh, Claire Abenante is a nurse and the Director of Primary Care and Women's Health Program and Independence Care System. Um, the ICS Health Access Program, which Claire leads, has developed and implemented a model of care that supports partner healthcare agencies in delivering disability competent care by providing trainings and hands-on support. And I've been speaking about ICS a lot, but I haven't said what ICS is. And ICS is Independence Care System. Uh, we are the first and only health home in New York State with disability expert staff and programs designed to promote the health independence of people with physical disabilities, like spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and other disabilities that limit mobility. So thank you all for joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Jose. Hello, everyone. I'm just looking at the line right now, and I recognize a lot of names. And Rachel, I'm going to go a little further by saying that, you know, I've been with ICS as a member when it was a um, MLTC, an insurance provider, for over 10 years. And the care that we received through ICS exceeds what we currently receive at different providers. Just want to put that out there. Um, I'm here gonna talk to you about the lived experience, basically. So I got injured in 1995, a little over 26 years ago. And for many years, I literally just went to my physiatrist for everything. And I didn't realize that um, at the end of the day, I don't wanna go to the physiatrist for everything. And that's where you need a primary care doctor. A uh, primary care doctor takes care of your everyday needs, you know, needs that don't need a specialist. You know, a physiatrist will take care of anything that pertains to your particular specialty, whether you be MS or, in my case, spinal cord injury. Someone that can tell you about autonomic dysreflexia. Um, a physiatrist might know, but might not know what autonomic dysreflexia is, but a uh, physiatrist will. And for those who don't know, uh, autonomic dysreflexia is a condition where the blood pressure of a person with a certain level of spinal cord injury rises exponentially and is extremely dangerous. Um, but 
in my case, I just kept going to the spinal cord injury doctor and, you know, seeing the residents and never really getting all of the vaccinations and proper treatment that I was oblivious to because I just didn't have a primary care doctor until one day I was reaching out to the doctor and there was no one available. And I kept asking, I kept asking, like, is there a doctor available? And finally, someone says, you should see, you know, this primary care doctor in the internal medicine department. And um, I was like, you know, something I really should start looking at seeing a different doctor because I was going to a clinic and at the clinic, you see whatever doctor is available to you. But your primary care physician specialized in seeing you individually. So I started seeing a uh, primary care physician at Mount Sinai and I was blown away on how much attention to detail she took in my health. You know, she went through my chart and pointed out things that I was missing, you know, vaccinations and um, took a bunch of blood work, checked my cholesterol, things that normally would be would have been done. But since I was not knowledgeable to the fact that I should have gone to see a primary care doctor and continue to see my um, spinal cord injury specialist, none of that got addressed uh, until probably 10 years, 15 years into my injury. So um, on that same flip, um, on the other side of the coin, you know, if you have a primary care doctor and don't have a specialist, you should definitely see a specialist as well because um, as an example of something that I experienced recently and not personal, my personal experience, someone that I recently met, um, this person was going to a general hospital, uh, seeing a primary care physician, and all of, his, all of his health needs were taken care of. He was probably healthier than me in most parts. But unfortunately, he did not have a doctor that specialized in his spinal cord injury. And he never got the knowledge uh, um, about uh, autonomic dysreflexia. And he unfortunately experienced a really bad episode of autonomic dysreflexia and he passed away. You know, just to really emphasize that, you know, we need both sides. We need someone to take care of our health side and someone to take care of our specialties. You wouldn't go to a dentist to wrap your broken leg. So why would you go to a spinal cord injury physiatrist or you know, a MS doctor that specializes in MS to take care of a cough? You know, just to use that as an example. So you, know, you need both sides of that coin to be able to have a complete you know, picture of your health. So um, I don't know if I have any more. You know, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. You know, it's, great that you guys get the knowledge because people with disabilities unfortunately die needlessly. You know, our care goes uh, overlooked over, uh, and bypassed. Even when you go to the doctor's office, you know, equipment is inaccessible. And a lot of times you're just glanced over because doctors can't be bothered sometimes with the getting you transferred or they don't have the proper equipment. So finding the proper care and the proper doctors and the proper facilities to facilitate your health is very important. Um, Jose, could you just share, because I, I know when we were talking about this and you alluded to it a little bit, but what you learned when you went on your first primary care visit, um, when you spoke about the immunizations, could you share that? Yeah, story? no. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first time I went to my primary care physician, I was missing a lot of the immunizations. Uh, I didn't have a pneumonia vaccine. Um, I ended up getting the hepatitis B vaccine, I believe it was. Um, but if you experience, if anyone here has ever experienced uh, pneumonia, it is difficult. And as a person with a high level injury with compromised lungs, um, it was one of the worst experiences I've ever had. And I would lay down and I literally feel like I'm drowning. Um, 
And I didn't know where to turn to. And if I would have had a primary care physician, I could have emailed them or called them and asked. But fortunately, I made it to my physiatrist and he took care of it. But that's the importance of having a primary care doctor. They look for these things. They look at, you know, things that normal specialty doctors don't look for. Um, a, a specialty doctor will, again, teach you about your autonomicus reflexia, something that is specific to your condition. A uh, primary care doctor, overall picture. Thank you, husband. Um, and just to remind everyone that there is an opportunity to put things in the chat. I don't see any um, questions right now, but you can certainly put there. And then for people who are unable to use the chat, we will um, take everyone off of mute um, at the end so people can um, ask the question if they would like. Um, so Janine, I think we'll turn it over to you then, Dr. Dr. Knudsen. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just start by saying it's such an honor to be here today with an amazing audience um, and really grateful to the ICS team for bringing me in. And it's a particular honor to get to go after Jose sharing his story because I think hearing stories from uh, people getting treatment from a primary care doctor is the most important. I'm coming in to share my experience as a primary care doctor, um, doing my best to take care of people with physical disabilities. Um, but really Jose's words and Jose's advice, I think are hopefully the biggest takeaway. And I'll just reiterate, I think from Jose, from your story, what, I, what I've what i heard, you know, I've heard the story before, but hearing it again now, it's just so important to find a primary care doctor that is willing to work with you to focus on your needs, um, but who recognizes their limits and knows that they still have to work with specialists and with specialty teams to provide comprehensive care. And um, you should all feel comfortable advocating and asking for a primary care doctor that's really meeting your needs because not every PCP is able to provide that level of service that you need. And you have to find someone that really um, is able to address the needs that you have. So in my presentation, what I'll go through is what an ideal primary care doctor looks like for people with physical disabilities. I'll describe what role they're meant to take on. And then I'll explain why it's really so important to go in and get the primary care um, services that, that I'll list out because it really can be so life-saving as, as both Jose and Rachel mentioned. Uh, so next slide. Great. So I pulled, um, there's a lot of different definitions of prim primary care, but I pulled the one I like the most, which is that a primary care practice, so a clinic serves as the entry point into the healthcare system. And it's meant to be that continuing focal point for all your healthcare services that you need. The reason for that is that primary care really focuses on promoting health and wellness, not just treating disease. It's focused on promoting health and wellness, preventing disease, helping people make decisions about their care. And then as Jose mentioned, if you have a cough, if you have an urgent issue to diagnose those new or chronic illnesses. Um, but, but that's, so those are the specifics of the job. But more importantly, primary care doctors, primary care physicians are meant to advocate for their patients and really coordinate the use of the whole healthcare system. So I am a primary care doctor practicing at Bellevue. I see it as my responsibility for all my patients to know what's going on with them at all times, to know what other doctors and, and other care providers they're seeing, what medications they're taking. I see it as my role to really understand that big picture and to be the advocate they need to help them get through that system. Next slide. Great, so, so that's general primary care, but now speaking about why primary care is so important for people living with disability, um, the, the most important piece that primary role that primary care providers can play is as your quarterback and your advocate. The quarterback is an analogy that I've heard quite a lot. I'm not a football person, <laughs> but the idea is that the primary care provider is really the one helping drive the ship in partnership with you as the patient. They should know what's going on at all times, like I mentioned, and really advocate for you to get the care that you need. This happens, um, this comes up again and again. I've had patients where they weren't getting the necessary supplies. And so I had to be that quarterback and advocate working with social work to get them um, a particular bed or wheelchair that they needed. Um, or another example is that as a quarterback or advocate, I've coordinated with multiple specialists to make sure that patients are getting specialty medications that were requiring a lot of prior authorization um, or requiring some um, additional education to make sure that um, the person got the right medication. And so it was really my job to drive that conversation forward. 
Primary care doctors are also mainly focused on keeping you healthy and out of the hospital, which I think is so important because I'll, as I'll get into in a moment, people with physical, physical disability are often um, have higher hospitalization rates than the regular, uh, the, the rest of the population. And that's something where the primary care doctor can really help. And then finally, primary care doctors keep the big picture in mind, particularly what matters to you. And so a good primary care doctor will not just focus on the things that are um, are holding you back, like um, medical comorbidities or, or um, issues like that, but they'll focus on things that make you thrive, like exercise, um, a healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, and all of that. Next slide. So the reason that this is all so important is that, as Rachel mentioned at the start, people with disability um, are really getting suboptimal care in many, many cases. And so uh, it's really important to get a good primary care doctor that can help overcome those barriers to care and improve the quality of care people are getting so that they can live a healthy, happy life and stay out of the hospital. The data unfortunately shows, and I will say many of you may have personal experiences or family members or friends that where you've seen this happen, um, but the data shows that people with disability are more likely to have difficulty accessing care, requiring multiple specialists and being hospitalized. Um, for anyone you know, on this call that's been hospitalized, it's obviously a, a bad experience in most cases that you want to avoid. And if you're able to get the care that you need in a clinic, in an office, um, it could be a much better experience and, and also avoid, um, avoid unnecessary suffering. And so uh, once I saw these statistics, once I saw these numbers, it really motivated me to work even more closely with ICS and, and other, um, other people to improve care for people living with physical disability because these numbers are unacceptable and primary care doctors can really help. Next slide. Um, another statistic that really struck me was that people with disability are less likely to receive preventative care. And I'll just say in, in my practice, preventive care usually um, includes cancer screening, screening for chronic conditions like diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease, screening for behavioral health needs like depression, anxiety, or substance use, and life-saving vaccinations. And so to hear that people um, are not able to get the care that they need um, for reasons that Rachel described, either the doc and that Jose mentioned, either the, the doctor doesn't think of it or they don't have the setup in their clinic to provide cancer screening to people who are coming in in a wheelchair. Um, that's all unacceptable. And so we need to create better systems for people with physical disability to receive the preventative care that they need. Um, I wish I could do like a show of hands from all of you to, to know like who's come in to get their regular preventive care. But I will say I meet people, so many people at all times who have not gotten the necessary cancer screening. Janine, you're muted. Yeah, Janine's muted. And Connie, just so you know. Oh, there we go. Okay. I I think Connie probably muted everyone just to spare us the background. <laughs> um, thank you, Jose. I'll just say um, that I've met so many people that have not gotten the recommended preventative care. These are people with physical disability, but also people without. Um, and it pains me to see that they have had unnecessary suffering. They've gone untreated for conditions that, um, that we could have caught much earlier. And to Jose's point, um, even with vaccinations, we could have prevented infection, could have prevented illness. Um, so getting standard preventative care, that's really the job of the primary care doctor to make sure that you get all of that. Um, there's a long list of things people need every year and they're incredibly important. Next slide. Great. Um, the final piece of data that really motivates me to continue this work to provide better care for adults with physical disability is when I learned about the health disparities that exist by race and ethnicity. And it's just particularly this, this past uh, year and a half or two years with COVID, seeing the, um, the fact that COVID was, um, had higher mortality and caused more suffering among Black and Latino communities. I think health equity and, and addressing health disparities is really on my mind and on many people's minds. So knowing that um, people in, uh, in Black and Brown communities are more likely to have disability um, and then also when they have disability to have um, issues like obesity and smoking, uh, that to me is, a, is really a big call to action that we need to provide better primary care um, because that primary care is one of the ways to help people improve their health and reduce these health disparities. 
Next slide. Great, so with that, I'll say, as, as you can tell, I'm so motivated by all those numbers, but also most importantly, by all the stories I've heard from my own patients, from Jose, from ICS. Um, I'm really motivated to help improve care. And there are a lot of other doctors and other care providers at health and hospitals who are equally motivated. Um, we have a lot of different clinics that are working on improving care for people with disabilities. Uh, the areas that we've been focusing on recently have been improving access to preventative care services. Like I mentioned, cancer screening specifically, but also immunizations and, and regular screenings. Improving access to accessibility services like wheelchair fittings, physiatry, and physical therapy. And then finally, better care coordination. Because again, as, the, as in my role as the quarterback and the advocate, it's really my job to coordinate care across all aspects of the system. And ICS has taken that on as their job as well. And so we, we together have this wonderful partnership where we really focus on coordinating care. So with that, I'll say we're in a constant um, state of trying to improve. The, the, that, that process never ends. This is a, the start of our list of things we're working on, but we're always trying to make care better at health and hospitals for people with disability, and particularly with our focus now on people with physical disability. So I'll turn it over to Claire to talk more about um, our efforts. And just wanna thank you all again for having me here today. Hi, everybody. My name is Claire Abenante, and I'm the Director of Primary Care and Women's Health at ICS. Um, I apologize, I'm having a little bit of problem with my internet, so if can you raise your hand if you have problems hearing me, and I'll switch over to my phone. Um, today, we learned that people with physical disabilities face myriad of barriers to accessing care. Physical barriers, including ramps and inaccessible equipment, narrow exam rooms, some attitudinal barriers, lack of physician training and exposure to, and lack of oversight of the ADA and local disability laws. The ICS Women's Health Program founded by the late Marilyn Saviola was designed to address these barriers through years of learned experience um, and funding from the New York City Council, ICS has begun to realize Marilyn's dream in bringing the blueprint for accessible primary care to life. As Janine has mentioned, and Rachel has mentioned, and Jose has mentioned, primary care providers are often the first to see and find early signs of cancer or chronic disease and other health concerns through screenings and early identification. They ensure that you get the right care in the right setting by the most appropriate provider in a manner consistent with your desires and values. ICS's partnership with h and has created a team to champion this project and we meet every two weeks. We wanna understand and address the changes that are needed to facilitate access to care for people with disabilities, including things like accessible equipment, wheelchair scales, transfer lifts, height adjustable tables. We're in the process of trying to get these pieces of equipment into the facilities that we're working with. We discuss modifications and interventions that are needed in order to improve screening, prevention, and care for people with physical disabilities. We've learned through the Women's Health Program that mammograms can be achievable with positioning aids and extra time. Now we're hoping to take those learnings to other screening tests and more attainable like colonoscopies. Identifying supports you need in navigating healthcare, like an interpreter or assistance in transferring. And lastly, this team is analyzing your experiences and feedback to improve overall healthcare. Um, for example, pivoting to a, a visual of virtual visit. <laughs> um, if the elevator is broken and you can't get out of your house and those are things that happen to our members or the what it's not in passable weather. Um, so the, the team that we're working with is really helping. It is, I'm sorry, it is muffled. 
I, I'm sorry, Claire. Um, yeah. I was just, it was a little muffled and I know someone had asked if we can do captions. Um, Connie, is that is that something we're able to do? Hi, sorry, I was uh, answering back in the chat box. We do not have um, closed captions right now because we um, we don't we don't have it right now. But in the future, that's something we can consider, or even have it for when we share the video later on. Yes, so we'll work on that. I, I'm very sorry. We'll get that available on our website. Um, but Claire, yeah, it just sounds a little bit. That's um, I, um that's why I was asking if you could right. just. Wait, I can yes. try to mute this and I have it on my phone as okay. well and see if it's clear there. And if okay. it poses feedback or a problem, I'll end that. Okay. Okay. Let's see how that works. Is this better? Yeah. No. <laughs> it is not better. <laughs> no, but when uh, you talk slower, it's clearer. So if you want to maybe pace a little bit, then. It's going to be okay. Okay. So then I'm going to end it here. Um, so I was talking about our partnership and what we've been doing with H and H and the pilot team that we've been working on. And now I'll talk about our side and the ICS primary care team. You called before your appointment to discuss what's most important to you and what your goals are for your appointment. We support the clinician in writing prescriptions for things like wheelchair repairs, supplies, and skilled nursing services. Because if anyone has ever had to get any of those prescriptions, you know how challenging they can be, not only for you, but for the physician to write, because they don't know exactly what Medicare or Medicaid is looking for in that paperwork. We serve as the expert in understanding the community resources for people with disabilities and assist the clinician and member with the follow-up that's needed in between appointments. We follow up with you after your appointment to get your feedback, to document and learn from your experience, help you coordinate your health care to get the services you need. Now, we can't do this without you. We've got a dedicated team of clinicians who are committed to learning and listening. And we want to know what's important to people with physical disabilities. We're working together to create best practices. The clinicians are very well versed in primary care and ICS is very well versed in disability. We're bringing our expertise together to create a better and more equitable experience. Uh, you want to know who's eligible? anyone who's in the ICS Health Home. Uh, if you're a member of the ICS Health Home and interested in having a primary care doctor affiliated with our program, you can reach out to me or our care navigator. My email address will be at the very end. We have providers in Three boroughs. So Claire, you're breaking you're breaking Morrisania Health Center in Bronx and Cumberland Health Center in Brooklyn. If you're an ICS member and not enrolled in our health can okay. I think we May have okay. Lost. Is, three, uh, is turning off my video helping? Yeah, it will, yes. Okay. okay. So, Claire, if you could just go over the referral information again, because we, we lost you on there. With, um, eligi so with eligibility? To, well, when you were going over the clinics as well, where we're working. Yep. Yeah. So, we're, we have preferred providers in three boroughs Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan. Morrisania Health Center in the Bronx and Cumberland Health Center in Brooklyn. If you're an ICS member and not enrolled in our health home, you can reach out to me or your care navigator and we can work on getting you enrolled. If you have any questions about enrollment, again, my number, my email address will be at the end and I would be happy to connect you to the right person. Um, as we mentioned earlier, in addition to a little Q&A that we're going to do now, 
we do have a survey that we're going to put in the chat box. We'd appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete it. We value your feedback. It helps us tailor our content to what our members want to learn about and would really be vital to this ICS pilot. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I'm sorry about my audio. Of course, it's yeah. Of course, it's bad on a day that's needed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, one is I apologize for for not having um, closed caption, and we will make sure to get that rectified and to make um, the meeting notes available on our website. Um, but when we're talking about this this project. Um, that we are working on with New York City um, Health and Hospital, a few things came up um, that we wanted to address because um, it's, it can um, impede people from moving forward. One is um, that sometimes, and I know Jose, when we were talking with Jose about doing this, he said, well, I'm not really sure that's where a system I wanna receive my care in. Um, and so we talked about that with Janine and we talked about this project. Um, and this project is really staffed by a team of people like, um, and Janine is, is one of them, Dr. Knudsen, um, where there is a dedication to caring for this population. And that these, these are not, we're not talking about that the whole system is ready. We are starting this on a, on a small scale level. Um, and we have hand, were picked our um, providers to really work with us. And, and New York City Health and Hospital System has really, um, the leadership there is really dedicated to making, um, to providing quality care for people with physical disabilities. And so if you're interested in joining, as Claire said, you can reach out to her um, and she can connect you. We have a process for enrolling people in the program. Um, you do have to, you know, be an ICS member. And if you're not, you're welcome to reach out um, if you want to learn more about ICS. Um, and Claire <laughs> can be the catalyst for that and get you connected. Um, and Connie, I think that might be the next slide. Um, and you've heard about the importance of primary care, but I also want to stress the fact that, you know, ICS might have been working for, we have worked, um, and Jose was right, we did start as managed long term care in 2000 for people with physical disabilities. Um, we learned a lot in the 20 years that we've, um, over 20 years that we've been serving members about what the community-based needs are. Um, and the um, team at Health and Hospital have been working for many years and learning about what primary care needs are. But this is really a joining of the two, learning how people with disabilities, what primary care, needs to be like for people with disabilities. And so that is a process we are learning together. When we went and looked at the research, very, very little is known about what people need. And we know that needs are tailored. And so Dr. Knudsen talked about things like colonoscopies. Well, we're working on that and trying to set up a standard of care because it is really hard to do the bowel prep if you have a mobility impairment. Um, and so how does the healthcare system have to support people? Um, and so working together with the specialists like Jose talked about, um, the GI gastroenterologist to find out, okay, well, what can be done if there's someone who can't get on and off the toilet quickly or might have, um, their bowels might be slow. And so working together with the person um, who needs the care to make sure that their voice is ever present in this and is the loudest. Um, and so that's what we are really aiming to do. So I don't want you to think that this is perfect and that we figured it out. We are figuring it out. It is a learning collaborative, um, but it is you know, very important. And what Marilyn has always said to us, it is important that we are listening first before we do anything and we create anything. Um, Okay, it sounds like someone's speaking. So I just wanted to. 
right. Um, it sounds it sounds like someone is speaking, and I, if someone has a question, I want to get to that. So I just wanted to give you an example um, of what we're doing in this program. And um, Claire's contact information is up there. And if anyone has um, problems seeing it, it is you can reach Claire at um, her email is Claire C L A R A I R E dot A B E N A N T E at icsny.org, um, or you could call ICS at 212-584-2500. Um, and with that, um, I will um, turn it open to questions. I don't think um, anything's been in the chat box since um, I started speaking. So if anyone has a question, please. Um, Connie, if we could unmute everyone. Um, give me one second. But okay. I, yes. <laughs> okay. I think, how about they unmute themselves if they have a question instead of unmuting everyone okay. at the same right. time? Okay. Yes. <laughs> You could also open up with comments if you have comments. Okay. I've seen a few comments on the yeah. chat. May I take this opportunity to learn, you know, from experience and from doctors on how to want to advocate for yourself and to find the proper care for yourself as well. I just wanted to say that I also added into the chat some of what I think got muffled and cut off the most during when I spoke. So you can read it there. I know that it's not captioning, but we will have that up when we get the video out. Mm -hmm. But if you want to just see it and have questions on that. Jose, I'll, this is Janine. I'll jump in quickly in response to some of the amazing comments I'm seeing in the chat about being your own advocate. And I will say, I think Anne Elizabeth put something in there related to that. And Marcus mentioned this as well. Um, I'll say as a, you know, some doctors don't, don't appreciate it when patients are advocating for themselves, but that's the sign of a doctor you might want to <laughs> stay away from. I, I am always amazed and appreciative when I have a patient who is advocating for their needs, telling me how they feel, telling me what has worked for them in the past, um, and really teaching me. I think it's my job as a primary care doctor to learn from my patients and to learn how to improve care. Um, I haven't been a primary care doctor for, um, for as long as other people. I've, you know, I've been practicing for about well, I don't know, I can't really count right now, five to six years, let's say. Um, I know I have a lot to learn and my best teachers are my patients. And so I think you need to find a primary care doctor who has that attitude um, because most primary care doctors don't have a lot of experience with uh, people living with physical disability. With ICS, we're obviously trying to identify those doctors, people like me that are gonna be learning and gonna be uh, working to improve care. Um, but really, I think doctors should appreciate learning from you all about how to improve care and really what's needed. So I just want to really applaud this call for you all to be your own advocates. And then you need a good primary care team that's going to partner with you on that. Um, but that is, yeah, something to really look out for. So thank you all that put comments in the chat related to that. Really appreciate it. Like, uh, I have a question that I received. Um, so most of the individuals who are in a health home or in some kind of MLTC are Medicaid recipients. And in the most part, a lot of us get discouraged because uh, seeking care because we end up going to clinics and usually at the clinics, we're seeing residents who are inexperienced. And mm -hmm. the physician, the attending doctor comes in for five minutes, you know, nods his head and leaves. Where is the, how is that different with a primary care physician? That is a great question, Jose. And I think, um, you know, I, I was a resident once, so I know what it's like to be a primary care doctor for someone as a resident. And I, I can totally understand that when, when you have a lot of different needs and you're really looking for someone with full experience, a resident may not feel like the right person for you. 
they are technically doctors, they're licensed, they're, they're able to practice, but they need that, um, that attending backup. And I think if it's, it's important to Jose's point, if you feel like you are, you are stuck with a resident doctor and they're not providing the level of care that you need, that you should feel empowered to look elsewhere. Um, most clinics, if you, are, if you tell them that you do not wanna see a resident, you wanna see an attending only, they should respect that. But I know with insurance restrictions that I may be painting too rosy of a picture. Um, yeah. At health and hospitals, I'll say that um, most clinics have a resident section, but then also attendings who see their own patients. And so um, if you work with ICS to connect, get connected to a primary care doctor at one of the three sites that Claire mentioned, uh, we will make sure that you're connected to an attending and not a resident physician. Um, so in, in summary, I think you should always feel that you have the right to advocate to, to have an attending physician instead of someone who's in training. Um, and ICS is really there to support you on that. I think that's, that's most important. And I wanted to uh, extend that further and say, you know, how about the communication between the primary care doctor and, you know, the patient? So again, with Medicaid patients, sometimes you wait a week, two weeks, three months for an appointment um, to see, especially a GI clinic. I think they gave me an appointment for, uh, let's say, October. And I, I got that appointment a month ago. Um, uh, someone I know tried to get an appointment today and they gave it to her for December. Um, so how is that different from, you know, a primary care physician? And, you know, do we have to forego treatment for that long before we seek a, uh, see a doctor? I'll answer that one, but then um, Rachel or Claire, if you want to jump in with any additional answers, please do, because I think um, there's a lot to, there's a lot in your question, Jose. It's a really important one. Waiting for care when you're anxious and you have something going on is not a good feeling. I've been there. I'm, I'm sure many of you have been there. And so I think getting timely care is, is your right, again, as a patient, and, and really important to know how to do that. Primer, most primary care clinics have systems built in for urgent care where you're able to get a, an urgent appointment. The limitation is that it may not be with your doctor. It may be with um, a nurse in the clinic or a different doctor in the clinic. Um, and so I think, you know, making sure to find clinics where you feel like they have good access is really important so that you're not kept waiting. Um, and at health and hospitals, we're constantly trying to improve that. I'll say, um, you know, it's definitely not perfect yet. I think people do have to wait a long time for primary care appointments sometimes, but we're always trying to make that wait time shorter. And more importantly, we have more tools now. So we're able to do more virtual visits like phone visits and video visits. And then we now have this online patient portal called MyChart where you can log in and send a message to your primary care team and they can answer your question quickly over um, what looks like email. And so you might be able to even avoid a visit in the first place because you got your question answered that way. So I think we need to lean on that technology and make it useful to, to everyone. Um, because it'll help you get the care you need faster. I think the final thing I'll highlight on access to specialty care, because what you know, waiting three months for a GI appointment, et cetera, um, is very frustrating and definitely the reality in, in most um, systems that take Medicaid patients. At Health and Hospitals, we have a what I think is a really cool new process called an e-consult process. So I'll, just as an example, if I have a patient who comes to me with a complaint that I know I can't handle, I need, them, I need to get them to a specialist. I put in an electronic consult to the GI, the gastroenterology team, and I ask for some help and information and give information. And I'm able to say how urgent I think it is. And that gives that team the ability to answer my question so that I can pass on the information to the patient or get the, book the patient in for a sooner appointment because they can tell how urgent it is. And so now that we have this way for me to communicate directly with all the specialists that I need, I have the ability to help get those appointments much faster than I used to be able to do. So again, that's, that's partly the role of the primary care doctor, but now we have all the tools in our system to try to make the care a little faster. Uh, Rachel and Claire, I, I think, again, I don't wanna to paint too rosy of a picture. I think it's always a work in progress, but what else do you have to add? Claire, I, do, you wanna, do you want me to take this? Or do you wanna say? Well, I, I, can, I can agree with, um, Janine, what you're saying is that we do, we do ask when we 
we talk to our members if it's urgent. And if it's an urgent appointment, we try to let the clinic know that this is urgent and see how quickly we can get them in. For right now, for our primary care appointments, we're getting those seen relatively quickly, I would say within a two week, um, with a two week turnaround. What ends up happening is then at the time at the primary care appointment, members are being booked for specialists then. And I've noticed that those are a little bit further out, um, but that's being done directly at the facility. Um, and you're, you're right, Jose, I, I don't even necessarily know if it's insurance. There, there is a big delay in getting specialty care right now. Um, but I, I can tell you, we are more or less getting to a two week turnaround for primary care appointments, which is wonderful. Yeah. The, the other thing, and Janine, please um, correct me if, I, if I'm misspeaking, but usually if someone's going to refer to someone, if a primary care is referring to a specialist and say someone is having some GI issues, a primary, the primary care in my experience has made a plan, an interim plan that should help the person until they get to that appointment. Um, and so I think until you are there, the primary care will help guide, you know, guide that issue. If it becomes urgent, um, then addressing that as well. Because to your point, Jose, you just can't say, all right, we'll deal with it for, you know, four months. It might not be as good as it can be. And I, I see that in my practice too, where we say like, okay, well, let's try to address this. And so it's not taking over your life, but, you know, someone who's, who specializes in this might have other ideas that I tapped out of. Um, and so I don't want you to feel like if that's the case that you you will just be left. Um, and then the other thing is that we, you know, Claire alluded to this too, is that we've used, you know, one of, one of the positives out of the pandemic is that telehealth has become widely used and that now specialists are able to, to have these appointments. So instead of having to see everyone come in in person, they're able to take a, a bigger panel, um, like see more patients a day because if they're doing telehealth. And so we've seen a slight improvement. I'm not saying it's, it's perfect, but it's uh, certainly improved. Um, Can I like yeah. make one comment? Sure. Um, I'm gonna like reiterate what Marcus said, you know, it's important for us as individuals with disabilities and patients to know ourselves, you know, know what we need as well. You know, just because we are patients doesn't mean that we all automatically rely on what the doctor tells us. You know, we have to know our own body and take yeah. a active role in our care. Um, and like, and, uh, you know, you have to also identify times where you can wait and times that you need to seek urgent um, uh, care it's yourself, you know. Know if it's a, uh, you can wait two weeks for a doctor appointment. Know if you can wait, you know, 24 hours for an urgent care appointment or know when you have to go to the emergency room. You know, those are some of the key factors that you have to really identify within yourself to make sure that you stay healthy and, you know, safe. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, and I think also with this, what we're hearing a lot about is communication, right? And, and using your voice. And so if we, <laughs> I'll just speak from my point of view, we can put a, a what we think is a beautiful plan together for someone, but if it doesn't work for you, for the person who we're creating it for, then it's not gonna go anywhere. So really to feel empowered to say, I know my body, I know my life and this won't work. Um, and the right provider will, will understand that um, and to come back together and create another plan. Um, and those who won't, then again, you know, uh, Dr. Knudsen said this, they're not right for you. Then it's time to find another one. And that's, you know, when we were looking at people to uh, finding providers, to, primary care providers to participate in this program, it was really important that we found people who were willing, providers that were willing to listen. Right, that is the most important thing that to listen and then to work together to come up with a plan. Um, and so, and that is, that is a work in progress. Um, 
there was someone in question said, can I, can I keep a primary care provider and um, participate in this program? It's really two, the primary care provider is, as um, Janine said, the quarterback. So it's really that person taking the lead and coordinating the care. So it's really important that someone has one provider. Um, and I know sometimes it can be hard um, to figure out to, to leave or to, uh, to stay or to go. Um, but that's really, you know, that's, that's really the point is to have a one primary care provider who can coordinate for you. Any other comments, questions? I think I'm gonna jump in again. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> um, this program, I'm gonna say where ICS was started with a person with a disability, Marilyn Saviola, who, you know, for as long as I've been injured has always been advocating for individuals with disabilities and made sure that our health was, you know, of the utmost uh, importance. She was the uh, disabled leader at ICS and she has left a legacy that will continue on through pilot programs like this. And, you know, right now ICS is, doing this in our best interest, you know, to make sure that we stay healthy and stay safe and, and, and living in the community. Um, so I just want to say, you know, thank you. And thank you for adding my voice and thank you for putting this together. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do it without you. Your voice, your voice is so important. Yeah. So I see it's seven o'clock. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our presenters. Jose, Janine, and Claire, um, you're all amazing. Um, and all of you for joining us. Um, it really was um, my honor to be with you all tonight. So if you have any questions, please send them to us. We will make this available on our website and we'll share our contact information as well there. Um, and that again is icsny.org. And thank you, Connie. <laughs> We always need technical support. Oh, there's the, that's the contact us, right? You're most welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Connie. Okay. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye.